We're in the third chapter, and we are looking at the, at the last of the seven churches. We've been studying through the seven churches of the Revelation, and I share with you that these churches are representative of the church age, and the church age began when? At Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came and filled the church, and the church age will conclude when? When Jesus comes back for the church, do we call that the rapture that we studied about just a few days ago? And so, what's the period of time we're looking at? It's that period from the time when the Holy Spirit came and indwelt the church at Pentecost. That was 50 days after Christ was crucified. And then it will conclude when Christ comes back and his church is called up because the Holy Spirit now indwells the body of Christ called the church. And so when the church is removed, then of course the Holy Spirit will be removed. And so we're looking at these seven churches, and each of them are representative of an age or a time period, if you will, in that church age. And many believe that this last church that we're looking at, the church at Laodicea, will be the final church, <coughs> the final uh, age, or the final phase, if you will, of the churches prior to the coming of Christ. So we can look and see some characteristics of the church today and ask ourselves, well, does it match up with this church here at Laodicea? And I think that you'll see some similarities. So we're in uh, Revelation, and we're in chapter 3, and we're going to look at verse 14 and following. Would you stand with me, please, and we read from the Word of God. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich, you become wealthy, you have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me Good refined, good, excuse me, gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye sand, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke, and I chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him, and he with me. And to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. And he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. May God bless the reading, now the teaching of his word. Won't you be seated, please? Where Jesus introduces himself in verse number one. He says, I am the Amen, I'm the faithful and true witness, and I'm the beginning of the creation of God. In those three statements, we see that he's the all-conquering one, he is the all-convicting one, and he is the all-controlling one. Christ makes it very clear who he is and who's speaking, so that the church will not make any mistake, make any mistake about who is the one who's writing this letter. And of course, he introduces himself in each of the seven letters, and his introduction to who he is tells you something about how he feels or how he perceives that particular church. In your outline, you should see that uh, the first thing we want to do is consider the declaration of Jesus. Consider the declaration of Jesus. We see that in verses 15 and 16. And Jesus says that you are not cold, you are not hot, but you are lukewarm. This church, Jesus says, you're not cold. In other words, they're, they were not ungodly or unsaved, but they were not hot. They were not committed or enthusiastic about serving him. They were just lukewarm. And because of that, he says, I'm going to just vomit you out of my mouth. Mm -hmm. That's a terrible thing to say. But that's exactly how Christ felt about this church. 
They were not cold. No, they were not cold. They were not hot. They were just lukewarm. He wants a church to be on fire. Amen. He wants a church to be alive and vibrant. A church that's full of energy. A church that's full of excitement about Him and about serving Him and about doing the things that He's called Him to do. But He says, this church was not that kind of church. It was a lukewarm church. It was a complacent church. It was a church that was just flat. Have you ever drank a flat Coke? Pretty awful. That is awful, isn't it? Yep, pretty awful. Well, that's what, that's what I think of when I think about what Jesus is saying to this church. They were just flat. They were just lukewarm. They were indifferent <coughs> in commitment. They didn't care if anyone got saved or not. There was no sense of urgency about sharing Christ, of reaching out to people to <coughs> share Christ with others. They were lukewarm because they were indifferent in their commitment. They were indifferent in their commitment because they weren't willing to serve. They weren't willing to serve in the Christ. They weren't willing to serve Christ in the church. To give of themselves to be instruments of His grace and instruments of His instructions. So there was an indifference in the church. But also not only an indifference to commitment, but an indifference in zeal. Indifference in zeal. Not willing to serve, not willing to give themselves. And he says, you just make me sick. Verse, verse 16. You just make me sick. So the first thing we notice is the declaration of Jesus. And it gives us the spiritual temperature of the church. The spiritual temperature of the church. So let me ask you a question. How would Jesus feel about St. Mary's First Baptist Church? How would he perceive us? Would he perceive us as being cold? Would he perceive us as being hot? Would he perceive us as being lukewarm? Is there a great deal of zeal? Lukewarm. Okay. You feel like you feel like some of you said lukewarm? Yeah. What should we do? How can we become more? <coughs> How can we become more what Christ is calling us to be? Got to get in the Word. Okay, Word. Share the gospel with others. Amen. Love others. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. More service. More service. Giving of ourselves. Giving to others. Okay. Alright, well let's look on then and see what else he has to say for us. Not only do we consider the declaration of Jesus, but now consider the diagnosis. The diagnosis made by Jesus in verse 17. He says, because you say I am rich and you have become wealthy, you have need of nothing, I do not know that you are, I do, excuse me, I do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Jesus says, this church thinks they're rich, but they're poor. He thinks that they got it together, but they're naked. He says, this church is deceiving themselves. So he makes a diagnosis. He says, you, you've lost your sense of values. You've lost your sense of values. They valued temporal things. It was the temporal things that were most compelling and most strong in this church. Not spiritual things, but temporal things. <clears throat> material things. They wanted a comfortable pews. They wanted air conditioning buildings, just an example. But they were after the temporal things and not the spiritual things. They're focusing energy, the effort, all is consumed by the physical things, the material things. They had lost their sense of value. And they had devalued eternal things. The most important treasure we possess is eternal life, is it not? Amen. Think about it. Of all the things that you possess, think about it. Your home, your automobile, your job, whatever it might be. All of those things are wonderful. They're, they're nice. They're good. But the most and the most precious thing that you have, if you're a child of God, is eternal life. Everlasting life. 
That's the most precious treasure you can have. Do you value it? Is it something that you cherish? Is it something that you are thankful for and praised for? Or is it something you just take for granted? Hmm. I'm afraid sometimes, quite honestly, if I'm honest with you, and I hope you'd be honest mm -hmm. with me, I find, sometimes find myself being more excited about temporal stuff mm -hmm. than about spiritual stuff. Can't have a witness. Mm -hmm. That's true of myself. And I find it's true of many of us. Especially here in America. We've become very comfortable, haven't we? In our churches. It would be good if we had to struggle a little bit along the way. If we had to do what some of the people in other countries, in third world countries, had to experience. We've got a couple visiting with us tonight from their church, from Point Peter Baptist Church, and they're on their way to Bahamas on a mission trip. I think you said there were 12 from your church who'd gone over there. Hallelujah. Amen. Isn't that awesome? They've gone. They've left their, their comfort zone and they're going to the Bahamas. And I don't know what you know about the Bahamas, but what I've heard about it is when you go over there, there's not a whole lot of accommodation because it's all been leveled and wiped out. But yet they're going in the name of Jesus to love on people. Amen. What a wonderful testimony. So I praise the Lord for our sister church, Fort Peter, for taking that initiative to go and be a part of that. So, but this church had lost their sense of values. They had also lost their sense of dependence on God. They lost their sense of dependence on God. They had put their focus again on their wealth. We're rich. We've become wealthy. And we have need of nothing. My, my, my. My, my, my. We got it made. We got all we need. It's kind of like that fool. Amen? He built bigger barns and put stuff in there, and the, and the Lord comes in. Okay, now, fool, what's going to happen to all your stuff? Because you're going to die tonight. And then what's all that stuff going to happen? Are you okay? And so yeah, they have lost their sense of dependence on God. Sometimes you have to go through a crisis to have that dependence reawakened to make you understand that you are nothing except for God. Amen. I was on my way to hell. I don't know where you were on your way to <coughs> God brought me. I was on my way to hell. But God, in an infinite mercy and grace, interceded in my life, he brought someone into my life to introduce me to the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> And through that introduction, I came to Christ. And now my life is focused and found my dependence on God. He's the one that I can depend on. He's the one that I look to. He's the one that enables me and strengthens me and walks with me. He told me. He'd never leave me ever since. He told you, sister, brother, he'd never leave you nor forsake you. He's there. Thank you, Lord. I love that story, don't you? Footsteps in the sand. Don't you love that? Mm -hmm. the guy gets to heaven and he looks back over his life and he sees the footprints in the sand. He says, Lord, look, look. He says, there were two, two sets of footprints until right then. And then there's just one set of footprints. That's, that's when you left me, Lord. That's when I was all by myself. And the Lord says, oh, no, 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 my son. That's when I was carrying you. Amen. Yeah, amen. I love that. Don't you love that? That's when I was carrying you. But this church had lost their sense of dependence on God. They were self-satisfied. They were smug. Do it myself. We don't need God. We can do it ourselves. Heaven help us. If we ever get to the place, we don't need God. But I'm afraid that we've gotten that place in some places in America today. Hello? In a lot of places. There's places in America where God's not even welcome. Do you know that? He's not even welcome. And it seems to me, it seems to me that some of our churches are moving in that direction again. They're having <laughs> church, but they're not doing it with God. They're not doing it for God. And they've lost their sense of dependence on God. Well, this is considering the diagnosis by faith by Jesus. 
Number one, our A is lost their sense of value, lost their sense of dependence on God. And the third one is that they lost their vision. They lost their spiritual vision. In the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18, the scripture says, where there's no vision, the people perish. Where there's no sense of seeing God and believing and trusting in God, where you can actually accept the fact that God is at work all around you. You know that, don't you? That God is at work around you? If you look, you can see him at work in your co-workers. You can see him at work here in the church. You can see him at work in, throughout the community if you're just looking for him. If you have eyes to see, if you have a discerning spirit, you can see God at work. And so, Jesus makes this diagnosis. And he tells them that they've lost their vision. Their ability to see God in their circumstances. Can you see God in your circumstances? This is yes. This is no. Can you see God in your circumstances? Somebody share with us. How did you see God in your circumstances? Where can you see God? Where have you seen God lately? Well, I, I saw God today. I was going uh, to get some lunch for, with my husband, and we passed by some um, apartments and duplexes, and I said, oh, I'm so thankful to God that we don't have to live in apartments or duplexes anymore. Not that there's anything wrong with them. We did our time in them, but I'm so thankful that he's given us the home that he has given to us. And my husband used the word love, and I had to work the conversation around to get back to blessing. It's not love. This is a blessing that he has given to us. Amen. Amen. And uh, I, because I came from um, a mother who worked very, very hard, a divorced woman, not that she wanted that, but because of my father's alcoholism, my mother had to get her family away <coughs> to, to really um, protect us. And I know how hard she struggled. So I grew up my teenage years in the projects here in St. Mary's. And I was surrounded by family. That was a blessing. If it hadn't been for them, I wonder sometimes what would have happened to us. And while there were trials along the way, and I was a prodigal daughter, um, God provided. And I can look and see that every day. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Thank you. Anybody else? Have you seen God in your circumstances? Mm -hmm. Is he not in your life? Can you see? Okay. We hear uh, have to support this. My husband has to be <coughs> one year. And the places they came out two days ago was not what we were expecting. And I was so frustrated about so there's to the there they want to go back to Europe and in the coast of my mom. I just went in my room and stopped paying for that. And I let it go. I'm giving it again. After that, I don't think about it. I know he's there. And I know he's going to take care of this. Amen. You just have to let it go. Give it to him. Have it go. Pray more, worry less. Amen. Amen. Pray more, and worry less. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> God's call. God's call? <laughs> Somebody answer God's call. Let's see what he has to say. Anybody else? You've seen God in your circumstances lately. Yes, Linda. Um, my, I have a son living in Texas, and he and his wife are, are pregnant with their first baby, uh, two months along. And uh, they were in the hospital this past week because she thought she was miscarrying, and it turned out as though... She needed an operation. She had a twisted ovary, and she was in tremendous pain. And it was great to, the first thing my son was telling me was how they were on their knees, and they were thanking God that they were there, and it was something that could be taken care of, and this baby would be okay. So for me, in seeing God, it's I brought my children to church, and here they are. They're Amen. still following them. Awesome. Thank yeah. you, Linda. Anybody else, real quick? See God in your circumstances. Well, start looking. Amen. 
Start looking because he's there. Amen. He's there. Start looking. Look to see where God's at work. He's on the. I love that study. If you haven't gone through that study, you need to do it. Henry Michael study. You know which one I'm talking about? Experiencing God. Yes, experiencing God. Absolutely. And that's that's what he talks about through the whole study. God's at work all around you. Look where he's at work and join him in that work. Okay. I rode that back far enough, didn't I? <laughs> Number three. Consider the directions given by Jesus. All right? So we consider the declaration of Jesus. Now we're looking at the diagnosis. We look at the diagnosis made by Jesus. Now we're going to consider the directions given by Jesus. Verse 18. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye sand that you may see. So the directions were given by Jesus. Number one is regarding their riches. He talks about their genuine, uh, having a genuine faith. Uh, I wanted us to look at a couple of scriptures. Could you turn to Matthew, please? Matthew, and let's look at the uh, 16th chapter and verse 26. Again, Christ speaking. I'm in Matthew 16 and in verse 26. <clears throat> For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father and his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. And so we see regarding riches, that we should seek the spiritual things. That we should lay up treasures in heaven. How do we do that? How do we go about laying up treasures in heaven? This is where you go. How do we lay up treasures in heaven? Do things for others. Do things for others? Sharing the word with others. Teaching others about God. Share with up, teach others. Share with others about God. Okay. Yes. Being sensitive and 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 when the Lord tells me to do something, to do it. Okay. Be obedient. Yeah. Be obedient. Absolutely. Obedient is really at the heart of, of us being able to lay up treasures. It's a hard one. Fruits of the spirit. Fruits of the spirit. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Stay faithful when we struggle. Nobody ever struggles, right? <laughs> of course we do. All of us do. Without exception. We all struggle in some area of our lives, and sometimes many areas of our lives. And so it's important then as we move through this life <coughs> to understand that the only things that are going to be worthy, the only things that are going to be lasting are the things that we <coughs> send ahead. That's right. That we lay up in heaven. And one of the greatest treasures, one of the greatest treasures that you and I can ever lay up in heaven is other souls. Yeah. Amen? Other people come into faith in Jesus Christ. What a blessing that's going to be. Can you think about how exciting that's going to be when you arrive in that place and you see Mary and Sue and Jim and Bill, all of those that maybe you had a word of influence in. Someone who God allowed you to be the instrument through which he touched their life. Can you imagine how exciting it's going to be? I get excited on earth when that happens to me. I was sitting in a mall. Yeah, I, I go to malls too, not just Walmart. I was sitting in a mall in Panama City, Florida. It's where I actually came to faith in Jesus Christ. It's where I was involved in a local church. It's where God called me in the ministry. And I was sitting in the mall waiting on my wife. That's what I do when I go to the mall. I find a place and I sit down and watch the people. And she goes and does her thing. Hello, anybody here with me? That's the way we do malls. Well, I was sitting, doing my thing, watching people. And this tall, 
guy came up to me. He must have been about six, four or six, five. And he said, Brother Vernon, is that really you? I said, yep, that's me. He says, you don't know who I am, do you? I said, no, I don't. And he says, I'm Barney. And I had a vision in my mind. There was this 10-year-old boy that I used to teach in Sunday school named Barney. He was the meanest little fellow you've ever seen in your life. I'm serious. He used to throw spitballs. He used to pull the girls' hair. Whatever he could do to disrupt the class, that was Marty. He was all about that. He was into that. I mean, he was, he was good at it, too. And he used to, and I, when he went to the sixth grade, when I was fifth grade Sunday school teacher, when he went to the sixth grade, I had a party. Woo-hoo! <laughs> Marty's gone! <laughs> well, I was teaching Sunday school then, and the Lord began calling me, and, and he called me to the ministry. And I went to, went to school, went to Bible college, and, and got, uh, got a church there, which was actually a mission from this church. And so this has been about, oh, I guess Marty was probably about 20 then. So he would have, that would have been about 10 years, 10, 11 years. And he came up to me. And you know, he, he said, Brother Martin, he said, this is Marty. And I didn't know what to say. I just stood there with my mouth open. He said, you know what I'm doing now? I said, I haven't got a clue. He said, I'm going to Florida Baptist Theological College where you went to school. I said, what are you doing that for, Marty? He said, God's called me to be a preacher. Help me help that church. <laughs> <laughs> the, last, the last young man in my, all of my years that I taught fifth grade would have not been Marty. I would not have chosen Marty. But God chose Marty. <clears throat> and I saw it. Uh, you know, it was actually the Florida Baptist Witness, which is a Florida Baptist paper that he put out once a week, I guess. And I saw the church that he was at. He actually went and started the church. And the church became the fastest growing church in the state of Florida. Wow. I thought, Lord help me. What in the world? Mark. Man, you just never know what God's going to do. Amen. Amen. Are y'all sure you're here? <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's blessed by heart. But can you imagine what it's going to be like when you get to heaven? And people come up and say, don't you remember we had that conversation and you, you were talking to me about how Christ meant so much to you? Well, well I, I accepted Jesus in my heart and that's why I'm here. You know? Can you see it? I don't like you do that. I hope that there will be a crowd when you get there who you have already sent ahead, <laughs> who have already gone before, <laughs> who have already made their place in their heavenly mansion that the Lord had built for them. So we see the directions. He says, regarding riches, let your faith be genuine. Genuine faith. And then he talks about clothing. Turn to Revelation 19. Revelation 19. And in Revelation 19, Jesus has a word about clothing. Revelation 19.8. To her it was granted, this is the bride, this is the church, and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linens, clean and bright. For the fine linens is the what? Righteous, Righteous acts of the, of, the saints. of the saints. The righteous acts of the saints. But also we'll be clothed in his righteousness as well. And so, as we think about this righteousness, Jesus is looking at the church, and he says to them very clearly in verse number 18, he says, in white garments that you may be clothed. He says, I counsel you to buy gold, fine and fire, that you may be rich in white <coughs> garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And then he says, anoint your eyes with eye, eye sight regarding sight. And we've already touched on that a little bit. We talked about vision. Without a vision, people perish. Without a sense of seeing God's presence in our life. Without a, a desire to allow God to move us in our lives. Where do you hope to be a year from now, spiritually? What are your spiritual goals? We talk about, we often talk about when we start a new year, well, I want to have X number of dollars or I want to do whatever. 
What are your spiritual goals in your life? For a year, for five years, for ten years. What do you want to see take place in your life? Do any of you have any spiritual goals? To be closer with God. To be closer with God. That's an awesome one. Yeah. What about it? anybody else? Spiritual goal? What's your spiritual goals for this church? Where do you see this church in a year? Where do you see this church in five years? Growing. Growing. In what way? We're talking about numerical witnessing, witnessing, and getting other people to work on. Okay, witnessing and sharing your faith and bringing other people into the into the kingdom of God. So we're talking about numerical growth, but also hopefully we will live the uh, maturing goal. Amen. Yeah. Spiritual goal, where we we grow in our walk and we grow in our willingness to serve. We grow in our willingness to be more obedient. We grow in our willingness to uh, see other opportunities where we can be a partner with. With, with God in other situations. Do something that will stretch us. Stretch us. Most, most of us don't want to get stretched. Amen? Be honest. I wish sure you guys were here tonight. Hello. We just don't want to be stretched. But one of the things that really stretches many of us is witnessing. Hello. <laughs> Am I wrong? It really stretches us. Because that's, we've got to step out of our comfort zone. We've got to reach out, be bold, in the name of Jesus. What are your spiritual goals? If you don't have any spiritual goals, then you make up the church. Then the church doesn't have spiritual goals, then does it? If everybody serves the Lord and is committed to the Lord as you are, what's our vision? Where are we going? What are we going to do for the cause of Christ? We're not talking about building buildings. We're talking about how are we going to grow spiritually in Christ, individually and collectively as a church. Those are things that you need to be thinking about during this time before God brings your man here. You need to be thinking about it, where he wants you to grow and how you can grow. And asking yourself questions like, how can I be a better disciple? How can I be used of God for his glory and for his kingdom? He may be calling you like he called those 12 people from Point Peter to go to another country to share the love of Christ. I know my wife is planning to go to Guatemala. Hopefully in June to be a part of that ministry there. We both went last year. She's going to go this year. She says she don't need me, so she's going to go by herself. <laughs> well, what about you? Where's God calling me? For me, it's prison. That's out of my comfort zone. I like it. I love it. But it's scary. Mm -hmm. But it's a place where God is using me, where God has called me to, where I know that I'm serving Him. And it stretches me. I'm going to be honest with you. It stretches me because it's in a situation where 99% of the people I'm ministering to have done things that I despise. Mm -hmm. But yet God's called me there to love them, and share the good news of Jesus Christ with them and uh, invite them and introduce them to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Now that's my area where God's moving and working in my life. Where is he going to move you to? Mm -hmm. Anybody got any clues? Is God calling you somewhere? Where is he calling you? I can't hear you. <laughs> I know, I'm just getting in your business. I understand that.
but it's so important. So Jesus gives us the diagnosis. He gives us directions. And then the declaration that he started with. And then finally, he wraps it all up with the decisions offered by Jesus. Decisions offered by Jesus. And we see that in verses 19 through 21. Did you know that Jesus will discipline <coughs> his church? Amen. Did you know that? Amen. I want you to turn the scripture with me. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 5 and 6. And you have forgotten the exhortation which, which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he, what? He chastens and he scourges every son whom he receives. In other words, if you're not being disciplined, if you're not being chastened, if you're not being scourged, are you sure you're saved? Hello? Hmm. He says he scourges and he chastens every, every. Did he say son? He said what? Every, every. Do we all deserve some chastening? I do. Yeah. And that tell you what, you didn't have a good whipping until you get whooped up by God. <laughs> Amen? Now my daddy was pretty good, but I, he can't hold a candle to God. I'll tell you. Look, verse 7. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with son. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are what? Illegitimate and what? Not sons. So, like I said, if you're not being chastened, if you're not being disciplined, you're not a child of God. Because He loves you. He loves His own. And He's going to chasten them. He's going to discipline them. One of the hardest things that you do as a parent is to discipline your children. Mm -hmm. At least it was for me. Mm -hmm. That was the hardest thing I had to do was to learn to discipline my children. But I did it because I loved them. I knew if I didn't discipline them while they were small, they would grow up and they would be undisciplined and they would get themselves in a lot of trouble. They would have no barriers. They would have no ba uh, walls. Yeah. And sadly today, sadly today, we have a lot of children that don't get disciplined at home. And my question is, why don't the parents discipline the children? Don't they love them? Don't they understand that they instill in their children these barriers, these walls, or these says so this is where you well, this is as far as you need to go. They need to learn. And the best way, and the only way that many of them learn is if mom and dad discipline them in love. Okay? I don't mean beat your kids, but you discipline them in love. And you can discipline children in a lot of different ways. I think one of the greatest ways of disciplining kids today is to take their phone away from them. <laughs> <laughs> Cameron told us at staff meeting, he said that those kids like to win bananas. Because <laughs> in West Virginia, you don't have any sales signals. You don't have any internet up there. So that for two days, they couldn't use their phones. And it was crazy. <laughs> they didn't know what to do with themselves. So I think, really, that's one of the greatest ways to discipline kids to know. Is just take those phones away from them. How to get their attention on a hurry. Are y'all sure you're here? <laughs> okay. All right. So we're looking at considering the decisions offered by Jesus. He talks about... In this passage of scripture that we're seeing tonight, verses 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, okay, he's talking to, to believers now. He's talking to his children. He's talking to followers. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Be zealous and repent. In other words, how about getting excited about what 
I've called you to do. How about getting enthusiastic about serving me? Put a smile on your face. Put some excitement in your life. And serve the Lord with joy. Be zealous. And then repent. Turn away from it. Going in that opposite direction. Go and turn away from that complacency. Turn away from that indifference. Turn away from the things that would lead you astray and away from God. And then he gives us a decision. That was the decision offered to the believer. Many gives a decision that's offered to the unbeliever, to those who may be cold. He's offered a solution for lukewarm. Now he's offered a solution for the cold, those who are unbelievers, who have no faith at all. He says very clearly, open the door of your hearts, verse 20. We often use this passage of scripture when we're sharing in a testimony, when we're sharing a witness, when we're going out and talking to other people about Christ. It's very 20, verse 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door or not. What door is he standing at? Our heart's door. He says, Behold, I stand at the door or not. If anyone hears my voice and does what? What? Opens the door. I love that. Have you seen that painting? I love that painting. Where Jesus is standing at the heart's door. And there's one significant thing about this door that stands out. There's no doorknob on the outside. It can't be opened from the outside. It can only be opened from the inside. And that's the way our hearts are. God, the Lord Jesus, is not going to force His way into our hearts and into our lives. We have to be willing to open the door and to let Him come in. Amen? So, He says, for those who are unbelievers, open the doors of your heart and then open the door of your future. Open the door of your future. He says, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Woo! Amen. You want to have supper with Jesus tonight? <laughs> Invite him in. What a, what a house gift. Lord, I'm glad you're here. Come on in. Is he welcome in your house? Is he welcome in your home? Does he feel comfortable in your house? Does he feel comfortable in your life? Understand that. If you're a believer, a child of God, he's going everywhere you go. Okay. <laughs> Do you ever take him places you wish, you, you know, he wouldn't want to go? Be honest. Yeah. Do you ever see things that you know he didn't want to see? When you turn on that boob too, do you look at things that you know that Jesus wouldn't, wouldn't want to be looking at? When you turn on the internet, open your hearts and open your future and invite him to come in and let him take control of your lives. Church number seven, lay out a seat. Do you see any similarities between Laodicea and the churches today? Mm -hmm. I do. I do as well. A lot of similarities. It's just another indication to me. Amen. It won't be long. Amen. It won't be long. He's coming. He's coming. Are you ready? I pray you are. Well, let's have a closing prayer. Those of you in the choir can go sing and make love with music. Brother Carrie, Brother Alex, yes. would you close? Yes. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for this, for this evening, Lord, that we can all be here to your house and worship. And Lord, just, just give us all that heart where we won't be that lukewarm Christian or that lukewarm church where we'll be on fire, Lord, where we're in our daily life where we'll know there's something different. Because, because of our relationship with you, Lord, just, just help us to all strive to be that way, Lord. Just give us the discipline to be that way. Lord, I just thank you for Brother Vernon for this message tonight, Lord. It's something that we all need to hear, Lord. We know that you're son and that you're coming back, Lord. We just have to, Lord, use our time here on earth and, and make sure that we do everything we can, spread your word, and show others how much we love you. Lord, I just thank you. Be with us as we all go our separate ways this week. Bring us back here safely next week. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen.
Amen.